Welcome to another episode of the Marriage Mentor Podcast with Eric and Jolene Engel, where Eric and Jolene answer marriage questions for believers, looking at the root of the problem instead of the symptom, always while applying God's wisdom and word for a Christ-centered marriage. Hi, I'm Eric Engel, and I'm here with my beautiful wife, Jolene. Yes, for another episode of the Marriage Mentor Podcast, and we are starting the new year off with a little different format here. It doesn't mean we're going to just stay like this for the rest of the year, but uh, what did you have in mind for us today? Today I have um, Christ-centered marriage goals. You know, as I look at the new year, I like having that fresh start, that clean slate, a do-over, if you will, um, as I move into the new year. I'm not... I'm not a fan of resolutions. I buck resolutions all day long because in my mind, I'm just a big fat failure at them. So I don't pursue them, you know, to. So you don't like, you don't like resolutions. I don't. I I don't think they work. (laughs) They work for about a week. What is a resolution? I mean, isn't that just a new goal? Is that what it is? Well, it might be a mantra of I resolve to do this. And it's just like with God in the mix, he's going to change your life. I mean, it's very much, and I, I used to be that strong type A goal oriented gal, and that's still in me. It's part of my personality, but you've got to make margin in your life for those divine appointments and for God to transform and shape you and, and walk the path that he has for you. So I think as I had come out of atheism and moved into Christianity, It was just like, well, as I read my Bible, I could have my plans all day long. But after 21 years of walking with the Lord, I want his plans. So I'm more, I have more of an open heart. I'm more pliable and teachable to, to his ways and not my ways. So that's kind of how I look at resolutions. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting that you say that. What what is that? uh, What is that saying that if we want to make God laugh, tell him our plans? Right. Is that it? So okay, well, you have this title, the Christ centered, the Christ centered marriage goals. Okay, so obviously you have some goals, not just some resolutions. Right. Well, I think goals. There's something to aim for, but that doesn't mean that they're my idol. I kind of see resolutions somewhat as, you know, if if it kills me, I'm going to pursue this and and have this resolve. So. I don't know. I mean, I might have a different perspective than most, but I think that as a believer, sometimes we could have amazing years where God has done tremendous things. And I don't want to do life in my own strength. And I don't want life to be, look at what I did. Look at how equipped and strong I am or how fabulous I am. There, You, you got to you have to leave room for the great I am. Okay. And that's kind of my, my take on allowing the Lord to move in your life and move in your, your year, you know, the months and so forth. And then when things don't go well, okay, for a believer, they're not always going to go well. Even a non-believer, Jesus said, you will have trials, not if, not maybe, not perhaps, He said, you will have trials. That's going to happen. And I want to take a moment and talk to kind of like the beat down Christian, you know. (laughs) You can identify with that. I I could identify with that. I couldn't wait until we closed the year on 2017. And I wrote an article about how I, I was just so glad to like close that chapter and move into 2018. Okay. My 2018 stunk like, like a a club of skunks camping out in my backyard. I mean, it was by far one of the hardest years. It was a year where I have never cried so more and prayed so more than the year of 2018. So I did not have an amazing year. It was, it was not a year where I felt God's goodness, although God is good. So what do you say to the person, to the believer, who is really in that place? And they they say, hey, you know, life isn't good. Or, you know, I, I understand that God is faith, faithful, but he doesn't seem like he's been faithful to me. 
<laughs> you ever felt like that? I I've had this mantra that I have to keep telling myself that God is good even when I don't feel it. Okay? Scripture says that. Right. God won't abandon me even when I feel like he has because that's how I felt. And as I have intentionally, as you and I have in, intentionally pursued Jesus this past year, it, it was just amazing to me how emotionally abandoned I felt by him. Okay, so how how do I recalibrate my faith? You know, how do I come out of the cynicism and the the doubt and the bitterness of where my soul has been since this past year? It's always the scripture. It is scripture that will help me realign and get kind of like that that spiritual adjustment. You know, some go to the chiropractor to get, you know, their spine adjusted. And if you're listening today and your your last year was just horrible, that you have to run to the scriptures to get the spiritual adjustment because that is what is going to anchor you to truth. That's well, it. you talked about last year. I I look back on the last decade <laughs> right. and say it's been it's been a struggle for the last decade. And, and still I'm hopeful, you know, and, and I am hopeful because without him, where else would you go? Right. You know, it's right. just, you know, like Jesus said to the disciples, well, will you two go away? And the response is, where else would we go? Where else would I go? You're the right. only one that has the eternal life. Right. Well, and you know, there, there might be some listening to this where their, their faith, they're just like hanging by a thread. And I've been there, friend. I have been there. But here's my encouragement. Keep doing those spiritual disciplines. Keep reading the word. For me, I have... I have a journal. I guess you could call it a prayer journal. But it's not maybe how most would um, have a prayer journal where they write down here's my prayer and then they look back and they see what God has done. You know, it's interesting because a journal, that's a lot of times that's more of a chick thing than a guy thing. Maybe. And uh, although I have in the past had a prayer journal and I would also recommend that because we are, we are forgetful. You taught me, you taught me to have a prayer journal. Okay. I did. We, I'm a pretty smart guy. Yeah. You're a pretty, pretty smart guy. Um, (laughs) We were dating, and you took me to the Christian bookstore when there were Christian bookstores around. You right. Know, there's very few now. Right. And you took me to the Christian bookstore, and you pulled out this book, um, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. Right. And you said, you know, read this every day and keep a prayer journal. And I'm just kind of looking at you like, that. that's a foreign language. I don't even, you know, as this baby Christian not having any Christian influence before you came along other than just going to church. I didn't have Christian friends who took me under their wing and mentored or discipled me. So you had said and have a prayer journal. Well, there was no like five steps to, you know, having a prayer journal right. or what you should put into your prayer journal. And I thought, well, I, I don't know what to put in here. So I would, I just wrote to Jesus I, as I'm talking to Jesus and I would drive to work every single morning and I get there early and I park on the side of the road and pull out my Bible, pull out Oswald Chambers and then pull out my prayer journal. And I just made that a habit. Now, Oswald Chambers, I didn't understand half of what he was saying. I mean, you know, he just hurt my brain that it was just like, what on earth is he talking about? Because he's using all these big words. And as a new Christian, it's just like, I don't know what this stuff means. Okay. But over time, I developed this discipline, you know, of just talking to the Lord in my prayer journal. Well, and and here's what a, a journal like that will do for you, or at least what it did for me, is that I would write down my prayers, my requests, my uh, my concerns, everything I'm praying about. So then later I can go back and go, that one was answered, that one was answered. He did this in that situation. He did this in that situation because we're we're like dumb we're dumb sheep. You know, we'll, we'll pray things and we'll, God will move in great ways. And, you know, a week later we forget it. Right. 
And if you want to keep your faith strong, you go back and review and remember what the Lord has done for you. Well, and you shared how you used your journal. Mine was very different. Okay. How was yours? I did mine, and I don't know why I did it like this. Maybe this is kind of how I was taught to pray. Um, I use the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. So as I'm writing, and I don't know if that's just the writer in me of why I did this. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me that did this so I would stay awake, you know, and not fall asleep while I'm praying, you know, because I could be so undisciplined in the prayer department. So ACTS, the first letter A means adoration. It's your um, adoring who Christ is and his attributes. C is for confession. And so I would write, you know, confessing my sins to the Lord. T is thanksgiving, and I'm thanking him for what he's given me, what he's done for me. And then S is supplication, and that's me writing, you know, my freak out needs, my worrisome concerns, and the like. And that's just kind of been the the framework of my prayer journal. And I've kept a prayer journal for, for over two decades. So anyways, um, if you've had that really bad year and you're having a hard time um, grasping the Lord's, um, the train of his robe and, and just recognizing who he is and his goodness, go back to the basics, what? reading your Bible, going to church, trying to attend a Bible study. That might be difficult for those that are working outside of the home. Okay. So here's something that I've always said is that prayer is the power that we have as believers. I mean, that is if you want to see God move, you don't just sit back in your can and say, okay, what's he going to do? Pray. Right. Because that, that is an active way of, of seeing God move. And, you know, at one point, uh, you know, I had this question, I, because I still believe God's going to do what he's going to do. There's nothing I can do to change what he's going to do. And so I thought, well, is prayer even a big deal? You know, do I even need to pray because he's going to do what he's going to do? And I was, I was reminded, you remember when we were talking about Daniel and, and Daniel was praying and, and the angel of the Lord appeared and he said, what took you so long? Daniel said that. Right. Daniel said that. And he <laughs> said, Jolene said that too. <laughs> well, but, he, but his response was, was that, uh, I was I was battling with I think the Prince of Persia or in essence Satan. Right. And it was right. your prayers, he said, is your prayers that so, sustain me. So was it uh Gabriel or Michael? Michael the arch- archangel who said to, to Daniel it was your prayers that sustained me? I don't remember which one and, and obviously I should probably be a little more brushed up on this before I speak about, it, but I just remember the statement that it was your prayers that sustained me. And it's just like, wow, his prayers are what sustained this spiritual battle going on. At f- of a, an archangel, no less. Right, right. So uh, That's pretty powerful when you think about it. Absolutely. I mean, when you stand back and look at, you have this angelic being that is designed to battle Satan. Right. Who turns to Daniel, a human being, and says, it was your prayers that sustained me. I mean, that's, I have a different perspective on prayer now. That's awesome, isn't it? Right. You know, and so when I say that prayer is a power that you have as a believer, I mean it is direct contact with God. To to we can enter the the throne room boldly, right? And make requests and and pour out our heart and 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 just talk to Him. And I mean that is huge power. When you think you know, and and it's really hard to to think about who God is because he is so much bigger than I can imagine. Right, okay? right. But, uh, you know, just the fact that he can speak things into existence. Try that one on your next uh, outing, <laughs> you know. So so just, you know, that power you have. And so many times we don't even tap into that power. No, no. I mean, if I learned anything over the last 12 months is, and I knew I was weak in prayer, to begin with, it wasn't, I, I pray. I mean, I have my prayer journal. Right. I talk to the Lord throughout the day. But in my mind, if I had to rate like how strong, committed, um, disciplined I am in, in, in prayer, 
on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you're just a rock star prayer warrior, I'd probably give myself a three. Now, over this last year, based on what I've gone through, you know, and how much I've prayed, I would say that it has moved up, you know, might be at a six or seven, but it's still not, in my mind, it's still spiritual discipline that I'm very weak in. And I'd want to be stronger in that area. So to start the new year in prayer, and and even if it's not, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, what do I pray about? I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. Uh, it doesn't matter. Just start. You know, I've never had that issue. I've never had that issue. And maybe as a young believer, I did. And when you sit in a Bible study and you're there with all the women and they're like, oh, well, let's do this. Let's pray out loud. And I'm thinking wow, just skip me because my prayer is going to sound like that of a fourth grader. You know, it's not this eloquent, you know, beautiful, flowing, descriptive prayer. That's just not who I am. And I remember always sitting next to this older woman in Bible study because I just love to soak up her wisdom. And her prayers were just, in my mind, they would put me to shame. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to myself and I'm, and I'm praying at the same time, right. Lord, Please don't let me follow Estella in prayer because it's it's going to sound like that of a fourth grader. But over time, the Lord just kind of taught me, you know, daughter, just just be you. Just talk to me and have a relationship with me. Well, okay, so here's the deal. And, and here's some encouragement for those who maybe feel that way. As we look at how God views us, I go back, and I've, I've shared this probably more times than I can remember, but I go back to when... Samuel was supposed to search out the next king of Israel. And he said, he's, he said it's one of Jesse's sons. And so he comes to the last one, and he's like, this, this one's good looking and strong and everything else. Surely, surely this is the one. And God's response is, this is not him. I have rejected him. And so he's like, you got any more? <laughs> well, we got one out in the field, you know, he's just the run out there taking care of the, the sheep. But God said, I have rejected this one because I look on the heart. God looks on the heart. Okay, okay. so you can say, well, I don't pray very well or I don't do this very well. It doesn't matter. It has to do with your heart. Okay, if you want to impress those who are sitting in Bible study, that's one thing. But if you want to impress God, uh, you need to have the right attitude. And he doesn't care how you sound. Well, no, and then you could quickly learn how the Pharisees had to make their prayers known to those around them. And that's a good contrast to not be so concerned with what others think about your prayers, because never once have I been, you know, envious of, oh, I'd like to be a Pharisee. Never once have I said, oh, yeah, that's what I want to pursue and emulate. So I guess I got over my prayer issue pretty quick. Um, when it comes to praying around others. And it's funny because when I go to Bible study today and I hear other women say, oh, I don't like praying out loud. And I'm like, oh, girlfriend, just let it go. It's, it doesn't matter. Just talk to Jesus because that's what it is. You know, it's just you talking to Jesus and developing that relationship with him. So as you move into the new year, um, one, one of the goals for um, any Christian marriage or a Christ-centered spouse would be to pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and that's first Thessalonians first oh I'm sorry first Th Thessalonians 5 17 and 18 so prayer um, is essential and yeah try not to bypass that just because of the busy day because it will settle it will settle it to me it settled my soul with with all my concerns and and worries and over this last year it was just like i've done everything i can i've prayed i've brought those requests to the lord i've remained steadfast in his word i tried to equip i've tried to comfort i've tried to cultivate you know there do your part in essence be 100 percent that christian person and yeah, you know, our timing is never the Lord's timing. You know, my timing was, okay, Lord, refine me. Teach me to be a stronger Christian, but teach me that in, in one month's time, not 12 months. Okay. <laughs> so 
the first goal that I, I think a, a couple should have is to pray without ceasing. And, you know, I'm not here to, for you, hun, to monitor your prayers. I don't do that as a wife. My, you're not my prayer monitor? No, I'm not your prayer monitor. And so I want to talk to the wife for a little bit because I'm going to bring in a, a list of some goals. But these goals are for you as a woman and not for you to... Um, kind of examine what your husband is doing. Now, if your husband says, hey, will you hold me accountable in these areas? Then he's giving you the green light. Well, okay. so, so here's what I want to say about that. Before you as a husband or you as a wife uh, say to your spouse, I want you to hold me accountable in this. Everything else has to be right in your relationship. If you're If you're struggling with trust and that sort of thing, have someone outside of your marriage uh, that you're accountable to as far as some of these disciplines. Because, And the reason I say that is because when you guys, if you are not solid. In what does what, that mean, solid? Well, solid. I We get a lot of letters and, and emails and voicemails and such about all these problems going on in marriage. And... A lot of it comes down to trust. A lot of it comes down to hurt. A lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, things we say to each other and that sort of thing. And if you aren't in in a great right standing with your spouse on both sides, going both ways, then to all of a sudden give someone the authority <laughs> to hold you accountable and say, hey, did you pray today? What did you pray? How was your time with the Lord? Okay. If that's someone that you're you're struggling with that you have you don't trust yet, like your spouse. Well, if there's a division among you, right, right, you have no you have no business. If there if you and I are divided, ain't no way that you have any business to try and hold me accountable. Right. That I guess that's what I'm trying <laughs> to say. Let's make it even simpler. Okay. You and I have a have a great relationship. But we don't hold each other accountable for our exercise. No. Because, that, you know, that's just a struggle for both I of us. I might knife you. All the time. You know, right. and you don't need me saying, hey, did you, did you do your exercise today? Or, hey, don't eat that donut. And I don't need to hear it either. Right. Because I love my donuts. You know, right. so. Right. I mean, you, you have to be able to stand back and say, hey, do I even have the right to hold you accountable if I don't? have any influence in your life right now because if the, the friendship has been severed influence that's yes, the word right so anyways I yes I understand what you're saying and hopefully you know although this podcast is for married couples in every podcast episode that we do or anything I write you always have to look at you your own conduct if I'm so busy looking at your conduct then it's so easy for for me to go off track because I'm running a race where my eyes are on you and not what's in front of me. Well, we call that being a part of the log brigade. Right. Okay. Right. And, and that references the verse where it says, uh, before you can help take the speck out of your brother's eye, you need to remove the log from your own eye. Right. Right. Okay. So be diligent in, in prayer if you're coming out of, well, and this message is not just for the, the downtrodden of 2018. Okay. I mean, <laughs> because those that are coming out of two, 2018 on this spiritual high, they've had an amazing year. There might be some com something coming up in 2019 that um, the Lord's going to refine you. And so not only is this a preventative message for those um it is a i hope it's an encouraging message for those that have been weary well if anything would have defined my 2018 it would be weary and exhausted filled with doubt and where's my god in the midst of all this uh, here's the bottom line is that it is a spiritual battle and satan is gunning for you if you're a believer right. you gotta be you gotta be ready Okay, right. whether you've had a great year or not, or things are going well, okay, he's he's gunning for you. Right. So be ready for that. Be be equipped. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's a verse that I absolutely love for the new year. Whether it's a great new year that you close the door on, or a, a difficult one, it's Isaiah forty three eighteen from the New Living Translation. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. 
Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. So my encouragement with this verse, um, especially if you've come out of that wilderness or the wasteland, is to keep trusting God. You got to keep trusting God because when there's no hope and you're in despair, it it that's a difficult life to live. And all it all it takes is for me to center it back on Scripture, to center my mind back on Scripture, because I could go to that dark place within two seconds. Well, think about think about when you are in absolute despair. You've just look. That would have been about it, last month. Well, you <laughs> hey. <laughs> You just got knocked off the ship and you're in the middle of the ocean without a life preserver. Mm -hmm. And there's not land or boat that anywhere near you. Okay. Who are you going to call out to? I'm going to be calling out to the Lord. That's it. Right. Okay. That, uh, that is your only hope. Right. So uh, if that's your only hope in that type of situation, why wouldn't you go to that resource early? Um, and on a regular basis, you know, and, and, and I look back over this last year and it's, I did that. I went back to the word over and over and over again, but it was just like, why does this not feel like it's spiritually sticking? I just felt like I was in this, not a rut, but it was just one issue after another where it's like, okay, now, okay, that storm's over, over, maybe I could get up and and kind of breathe and then boom another wave comes and I'm drowning and and just as I'm coming out of that wave there's there's another one so I guess looking back although I don't feel it um I'm sure I'm a lot more spiritually stronger because you know when you're running any type of race if if I'm running a 3k or, uh, a, a 3k or 6k like a uh, or I'm sorry, a 5K or 6K, whether it's Five a three ten. mile. Yes, I think, you know, okay, <laughs> anyways. Yeah. Um, whether it's a three mile race that I'm running or a five mile race, or am I, I'm missing that, I'm sorry, six, six mile race. If I set my sights on running six miles and I'm training for six miles, then running that three mile race is easy peasy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Okay, because I've been training for the 10K. Right. But if I've been training for the 5K, okay, yeah, I, I barely made it those three miles that I can't even imagine that I had to go run six instead. All of a sudden I get to the start and the race director says, oh, I'm sorry, this is for the 10K. And he's already, you know, shot the gun and here I'm off running thinking, well, no, I'm going to be finished at, you know, a certain mile marker, but then I have to run longer. Now all of a sudden the training, I'm in that training mode. I'm, I'm running it. I'm exhausted. Okay. I recover and then I get back up and I do it again because my body has said you were capable of doing this. You know, where, when I look at these trials that I've been through, it's just like, <laughs> I said to you one day last week, I'm like, it's not supposed to be like this. This, sh it should not be getting harder, you know, spiritually, but yet I have to be mindful of the fact that the Lord, he's, he's training us, he's refining us, he's strengthening us. And yes, that brings me to, it brings me to one of my verses, um, which is rest. You asked me recently, I don't know, what I was doing that day. <laughs> and I said, well, after you left, I went back to bed. I didn't get up until, I don't know, close to one o'clock. And then after that, I did absolutely nothing. And you're like, you didn't go to the bookstore? I'm like, nope, I did nothing. Rest was on my to-do list. Because okay. when you're running that race, the, the race of the Christian life, you, you have to, you have to rest. You know, you, you can't go through life at this, the speed of, you know, you're sprinting it. You just can't. And when the trials come, that my next step was I got to recover. Well, I got to so, recover from this. So let's just be clear. The Bible says that you will have trials and tribulations. Right. You will. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're thinking about becoming a believer, uh, just know that uh, <laughs> up front. But here's the deal. You're going to have trials and tribulations if you're not a believer. Whether so, it's the just or unjust. Right. You know, so... so I think you would pick the better part 
and and have the Lord on your side rather than not on your side. Right. Well, and it, Psalm 4610 says, cease striving and know that I am God. You know, in those those type A personalities or coming off of a spiritual high or this fantastic thing that I just did, it, it's it's easy to run without any weight on you because you're exhilarated. Okay, well, when the trials come, life is heavier. It's harder. And you have to run to your refuge, which is Jesus, and you have to you have to rest. So what would you define as striving? Striving. As a young Christian, I would have been I just thought I could take on the world. And- I, I remember that. <laughs> Okay, and I, I just just so you know, I only have like a handful of stories, you know, and, and and my kids tell me, "Hey, you've told me that like fifty times." Well, I'm sorry, I only have a handful of stories, and and so I, I want to share a story. I probably shared it before, and probably even a half dozen times. But uh, at one point, you walked downstairs. You had gone to bed. You were restless. I was still up. You came back downstairs and I'm on the computer and you're, you say to me, I was wrestling with the Lord and I told him to bring it. Okay. And I thought, oh boy, because I had been a Christian for a long time. Right. Uh, you were a newer Christian. Yeah. I should probably say maybe a couple of years. I don't even remember that. I don't believe I had kids at that point, but. Uh, well, and at that point I'm sitting there looking at you and going, Okay. Uh, do you really know what you're saying? Okay, and I, I don't think you even understood what I was saying. No, I didn't. But do you, do you really know what you're saying? Tell the Lord, hey, bring it. Bring it on. Hey, I'm ready. Okay, well, he's brought it. He has brought it. And, and he will bring it more, you know. And I, and, and I jokingly say that, uh, well, uh, these, these trials and such are because of your statement and your stance at that well, point. Well, it's funny because you shared that story with our sons. They're now 17 and 19. And after he shared it with them, my 19 year old looks at me and he goes, well, okay, so it's all your fault. You know, <laughs> all this stuff that we've been through. And it's just like, you know, God's on the throne. He knows what he's doing. We can safely trust in him. And when those trials come and we forget that, you know, we have to go back to the scripture. And, you know, ultimately I wanted to be used by God. You know, that was, that was my heart back then. That is still my heart. But now I'm slower to say that, you know, for years I had that Isaiah verse of here I am, Lord, send me. And now I'm like, oh no, I don't know about that because (laughs) I know now the call he has on my life, not just as a wife and and a mom and, and a godly woman, but to reach, um, the, the church to disciple his people, um, I, I was walking home one day because I no longer really run home. You know, it's just like, I don't have that in me. But as I, I was walking home, I thought, gee, Lord, is this, is this what my life is going to be? Just a bucket full of trials 24 seven, because I'm a writer and I bring messages. And obviously our messages aren't these shallow messages, you know, because if you want to be deep, you got to go through the deep stuff. And it's just like, man, I've been out in shark infested waters for, I don't know how long can you say bring that me to again? Shore? Because that was a statement that our pastor made years ago. And he said, if you want to be deep, you got to go through the deep stuff. Right, right. And my heart is to disciple the Christian woman. And I can't disciple her if I don't have any idea of what she has experienced. Well, then you've so, you've done well. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like my own stupid fault. of, But God knows my heart. You know, he's got to take me through this stuff so I can minister to others. So, you know, let me let me go back. I'm not sure how far into our time I, we, we've gotten, but I want to touch on these other things. Remain hopeful. Psalm 37, 25 says, Once I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for food. Again, I have to remind the listener, you may feel forsaken. You may feel like, man, last year... I don't even want to get out of bed for 2019 because it's just, you know, going to be a repeat of 2018. (laughs) But remember that, you know, you're not abandoned. God, you know, he's not going to leave you. Um, Here's something that I try and look at as we move into each year. 
Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. So create a vision, even in art for years, for years, I would always be so excited to talk about the new year and the coming plans. And then for the last decade, I'm like, there are no dreams. This squirrel has no dreams because I'm just going to get slammed by one trial <laughs> after another. There's no sense in going to the Lord saying, gee, Lord, I would love for all this to happen. Here, let's work together and make that happen. Now I'm just like, okay, as I step onto the roller coaster of life with Jesus, Lord, help me to just hang on. Okay. But my soul is restless with that viewpoint. Okay. I can't just remain a passenger. Okay. Right. I still have to go back to the word and still say to you, well, let's be hopeful. Know that God hasn't abandoned us. Let's keep trusting God. Let's create a vision. What's our vision for this coming year? You know, sit down with your husband and, and have that conversation. And it might be very, it might be very small. It might be, you know, okay, I want to keep doing ministry or we want to, you know, clear down some debt, raise up the kids, just pick an area where you feel like, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you. Right. Well, and it's, and it can't be, I, I know I'm the type of guy that I'm just like, hey, it's a new year. I want to climb Everest <laughs> this year. Right. And I want to climb out of bed. You know, but I, but it's just like, you know, take some small things and not many, but some small things and be faithful in those things. Because if you, if you have these big grand viewpoints of, of I'm going to accomplish all this, you know, you might defeat yourself. I know for myself, <laughs> they say it takes what, two or three weeks to change a habit. Okay. For I me, think the older you get, the longer that I'm is. I told you for me, it takes two years to change a <laughs> habit. And, and you know, that's funny, but it's no joke. Uh, it, I can't just change a habit in two weeks. Like maybe some other people do. Okay, it takes me a long time to change some things. So focus on those things. Yeah, I, I guess take baby steps, what you're saying. Because, right. Because, you know, let's, for an example, this podcast, you know, we, we've already recorded several podcasts for this coming year already. We haven't released them. And you said to me, well, you're not going to do an episode every single week. And I'm like, have you lost your mind? Okay, that, I, we did hardly did any podcast episodes last year because it was just, such a hard year for us that I'm like, I can't make that commitment to having an episode be released every single week. So let's see if I could do it every other week. And if I can't do every other week, can I commit to once a month? So do I, I at least feel like there's some continuity and consistency there. Do I need to show up without you? <laughs> Maybe, you know, you could do a podcast for the men. I'm sure all the women would love it. Okay. What's your next point? Okay, here's my next point. Um, act like Jesus even when you don't feel like it. Okay, when you move into the year, you will face that refinement, the refiner's fire. You will face discouragement and the trials and the tribulations and, and everything that comes with just doing life with in a fallen world. Okay, and so Proverbs 10, 12 says... Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. And you might think that's a really odd verse to put in for marriage goals. Okay, I could look at our last year and being just so stressed and stretched and refined. And, and it was just, what do I need to do? to make sure I am the woman I want to be so in the midst of all this pain. When you talk about love covers all wrongs, uh, is that wrongs done to you? Is that what you're talking about? You know, I think that verse could be wrongs done to me or where when my heart feels hatred. Right. It has felt a lot of hatred this past year. <laughs> <laughs> Such a real honest podcast, huh? But I have to go back to the scripture that even though my mind and my heart might just be so filled with dark, evil thoughts, what does the scripture say? And what's going to define me? Is the scripture going to define me or are my emotions going to define me? And can I justify those actions? Oh, hands down. 
I could have a list of justifying all the reasons why I could be, you know, hateful in these situations. Well, let's let's reverse engineer this because I look at the word conflict. I would say, hey, if you have conflict, is it because hatred has stirred it up? Okay, examine yourself, examine your relationships, and then there's a solution. But love covers all wrongs. Right, right. So I already talked about rest. Get the rest if you need it. I know some are already hitting the gym. I hit the snooze this but this morning on hit, January 1st. Hitting the gym for the first uh, week and a half or two weeks. Right, right. I won't go to... It's funny because... I've learned the cycle. I mean, we've gone to a gym, we've exercised our entire lives. And I just know, don't go to the gym the first two or three weeks because, you know, these are all people who don't go to the gym on a regular basis. So for me, I won't even bother going. I'll do exercise elsewhere as long as it doesn't rain. But, you know, kudos to them that they're trying. But again, a lot of it is just creating a habit. And even if it's, even if you could only exercise once a week, make that a habit. Right. Okay. Okay. But I really, really hope that reading their Bible and, and going to church on a regular basis becomes their number one habit that they focus on because that's going to carry them in, into or carrying them out of the storms or helping them survive, you know, when they feel like they're drowning. OK, um, I have on here another goal is to be forgetful and press on because um, it's easy to dwell on the pain. It's easy to dwell on the past and the, the scars and the circumstances and really have to make the the decision in your mind to close the door on your past. And my favorite, one of my favorite life verses is Philippians 3, 13 and 14. As, and this is Apostle Paul talking. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the the word that stands out to me the most in this section is forgetting. It's a present tense ongoing verb. Okay, now I'm not a grammar teacher, so I don't even know if I got that right, but I know it's not past tense. It's an ongoing thing. Right. Forgetting is. that you do it over and over in your mind. And I think women really need to, to latch on to that because we're more we tend to be more emotional than men. We might have a tendency to hold on and be a little more um, critical. And if you could start exercising your mind to learn to kind of be that forgetful woman in a good way, it will help you out emotionally. Well, I find what's really interesting here is I, since I coach business people in their business and in their marketing and, and help them move forward, uh, one of the points I make with them is that virtually Everyone who is stumped or stuck in some place, it's normally because of something in their past, okay? They look back and say, I wasn't very good at that, or I failed at that, or I haven't been able to do that in the past. How can I, how can I do that in the future? And everyone, everyone has baggage in their past that causes them or, or, or tries to keep them from moving forward. And, and that's Satan, Right. I mean, he's, he's right there. He's ready to remind you of all your failures. I struggle with that. I struggle with many failures that, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It doesn't do me any good, you know, but, but yet I think back, oh, you know, if I had only done this or that or, or acted differently here or, you know, I wouldn't be in this situation. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, there's this movie, not a Christian movie by any means, but it was called The Edge. And ultimately, this the these guys, they're in a plane crash in the Yukon, I think the Yukon, and this bear, this huge bear was stalking them. <laughs> okay. Okay? And they're like, we're going to, one of them was like, we're going to die. And the other one, played by Anthony Hopkins, said, you know why people die in the wilderness? He's like, no, why? They die because of shame. And they die because of shame because they think, how did I get here? How did I ever put myself in this situation? And they're always going back to their past and thinking, you know, I screwed this up. And and, and it just made a great spiritual point for me that, uh, you know, we tend to inhibit our future because we're always looking back to our past. And Paul makes a point of saying, 
stop doing that, forget the past and move forward. Right. And there might be some listening today that are just filled with regret or they're filled with shame. And my encouragement is, you know what, Jesus already died on the cross for your sins and, and let, let your mess go. Okay. Let it, let it go. You don't need to go back and keep dwelling on what you did wrong because the Lord doesn't. Well, the Bible says that he forgets Mm -hmm. our sins. So the only way he remembers them is when we keep bringing them up. (laughs) Well, and, or this other spouse points it out and it's just like, you know, don't do that stupid garbage because you're just tearing down your marriage when one spouse is picking out the other spouse, how they fell short. And it's just like, we all fall short. I mean, that's Romans 3.23. There's none perfect except Christ. And if you could really kind of embrace grace and embrace forgiveness, the what Jesus gave to you, then that should move through your veins so you could then pour that into others. But if you're not, if you're not really embracing God's truth for, you know, your sins and your shame and your past, you're going to stumble in your marriage and you're going to be examining really kind of being that hypocritical spouse. And that does not make for a loving, joyful, fun, fulfilling marriage. So forget Forget your past and, and move on. And the last one I want to close with is Romans 12, 1 and 2. And my point is surrender to God's word. The scripture says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable ser- service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, there's a huge pull on the world. There's a huge, you know, pull from the enemy. And remain steadfast. Let the Lord transform you. Uh, don't follow the patterns of this world. But how, how do you know what are the patterns of the world and what are the patterns of the Bible? You have to read the Bible to know. Okay. Right. Well, and, and it's simple. That's, uh, the Bible's a big book. And you might say, well, I don't know where to start. If you just want to learn some of those truths, go through Proverbs and read a chapter a day. Okay, I mean, read other parts of the Bible as well, but read a chapter a day in Proverbs because there's 31 chapters and I would do that month after month after month. Okay, and you'll start you'll start getting it right? and understanding, hey, that's not good. I shouldn't be doing that or that's not good or this is the way I should go. Right. So I hope what we've shared um, will really kind of cast a vision for you depending on where your heart's been this previous year, what God's stirring in your heart for the upcoming year, you know, God might have you, you know, really strong and flourishing. And he has got some tremendous plans for you ahead this year. Others might be you're in recovery. That's where I feel like I am. I'm in recovery, but that's okay. I'm okay with that because you know, if you're running a marathon, you can't generally run a marathon on Monday and then get up and go run another marathon on Tuesday. Usually you rest. Right. You know, so anyways, those are our thoughts. Um, until then, embrace your choice. I'm, I'm Jolene Engel at JoleneEngel.com. And I'm Eric Engel right next to my wife, wherever <laughs> she's at. 